And all God's people said, oh, God is good. And all the time, oh, the best is yet to come because he is forever with us and walks ever faithful before us. Well, welcome to this summer teaching series titled, Say Yes to God, where Proverbs chapter 3 is our guide on how to say yes to God with our lives or how to live daily in agreement with God's word and with God's truth. There are eight ways that Proverbs chapter 3 teaches us how we say yes to God. The fourth way is this. We say yes to God by giving back to Him. We say yes to God by giving back to our Lord. Did you hear these words from Proverbs chapter 3? Verse 9, honor the Lord with your wealth. Honor the Lord from the first fruits of your crops. Your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats overflowing with new wine. In 2014, a survey compiled the top most difficult conversations that we Americans have. Of those top hot-button conversations, number two was death. And that makes sense, does it not? We're very uncomfortable at times talking about death. But that leaves number one. So you may be saying, Pastor, why does the number one most uncomfortable topic among Americans? And that answer is money. How could you guess? Yes, money is a very uncomfortable conversation for each of us. People in America would be more comfortable talking about death than money. This topic seems to put each of us at a place of uneasiness, even in the body of Christ. When the topic of money or wealth or giving arises, there at times creeps within our hearts this sense of uneasiness. So I want to ask you just to relax. It's okay because God's Word takes care of us, not only with pinpoint truth, but with love as well. And we can receive from God's Word what He has to say about giving back to Him. We're journeying through Proverbs and we're hearing and receiving so many powerful truths about how we align our lives with God but then we hit some uncomfortable topics, do we not? Last week, we spoke about personal sin. This week, about money. We're getting all the difficult topics over in one month, and I'm glad. These are tough topics to deal with, but look at the beauty of God's Word. If you honor God with your wealth, if you honor Him with your first fruits, it will go well with you. The topic of first fruits, incidentally, is not restricted to the Mosaic Law, the first five books of the Bible, because here in the wisdom literature, we're being told how to give. And this is an essential piece of who we are as followers of Jesus. So I'd like to share with you three very simple principles that are not simply uh, stated as application, but they come from my own life as principles that are very real and, and, and reflecting how God has convicted me as well. So consider these principles of giving that come from this fourth way we say yes to God by giving back to the Lord. So I want to share these principles with you. Principle number one, honoring God by surrendering our finances back to Him. This is very important because it defines true discipleship and it's a very practical test of faith. Honoring God by surrendering our finances back to Him uh, is, a, is a way of defining true discipleship and becomes a very practical test of our faith. Now let's look at how this passage before us indicates that giving back to the Lord is a true defining measure of our discipleship. All throughout Proverbs chapter 3 and all throughout the book of Proverbs, you will see that the writer God raised up, Solomon, addressed the recipients with my son. In fact, several times in this chapter, that phrase indicates the divisions of 
this particular focus. My son represents it, literally those who were students under the writing, under the wisdom that God gave Solomon. But this statement foreshadows all children of God. So God is very interested in how you and I give back to him. This is a sign and an expression of true discipleship. Now, giving does not uh, completely define discipleship, but in part, giving truly speaks of who we are as followers of Jesus. So let's discern how giving, for just a moment, defines discipleship, and then let's discern how giving is a practical test of faith. Giving defines discipleship because, again, the attention is drawn to the child of God. This is vital for you and for me. If we claim to follow Jesus, then how we give of our blessings back to God is of vital import to who we are as followers of Jesus. Do you know that God has been so good to us? Hasn't he? God has blessed us and, and poured on us his goodness in two very distinct ways when it comes to wealth and when it comes to finances. James chapter 1 verse 17 tells us that every good and perfect gift comes down from God. Would you agree? Every good and perfect gift comes from God in whom there is no shadow of turning. James 1 17. So whatever there is in your life came either by just a very clear blessing that God has poured on you or by the fact that God has allowed you to earn and to receive wages. You see, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, we are told of an Old Testament uh, truth. The laborer is worthy of his or her hire. Now, I love this principle because in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 13, we are told that if anyone is drinking and eating of their labor, this is a gift from God. So this uh, underscores those who might say, well, I have blessings in my life, but it's because I work so hard and, and I have an entrepreneurial approach to life and so I know how to make things invest and last and return. That may be so, but you would not be in that place if it were not for the goodness of God. Drawing that principle timelessly that a labor is worthy of his or her hire or wage. So God has blessed us both by giving us his blessings, and by allowing us a chance to earn and to receive the rewards of our labor. Now, because this is so clear in the lives of God's people, God cares about how we take what he's given us in one of those two ways and returning that back to him as saying, God, I praise you for blessing me. How does God instruct us to return to him the blessings he's given us? Well, in the Old Testament, he instructed Israel to bring a tithe into the storehouse. Do you remember that? In, in Malachi chapter 3, incidentally, verse 9 and 10, the scripture says, don't, don't think that it's okay to rob God, but bring into the storehouse what is his. Now let me clarify this with another scripture. The best commentary on God's word is God's word. In, in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, this is what we're told. We are told that God instructed early on in the life, life of Israel Bring a tenth of your crops into the storehouse. And then that encouragement is qualified because it, meaning the whole produce, it belongs to God. And then the scripture says it is holy. So whether it be the seed that goes in the ground to bring the crop or whether it be the crop itself, this belongs to God and this is holy, consecrated to him so in the scripture, Israel was told under a, a theocratic government, meaning God-centered, that you're to take a tenth of what you bring in from the field so that the temple worship and so that all that God is interested in with his people can be supported. Now notice what happens when we look for the word tithe in the New Testament, particularly in the writings of the church. It's as if that word is not used as much and very little uh, in the words of Jesus and not at all particularly uh, as the church is addressed. Why is this? Because tithe gives us the discipline as God's people to give what God has blessed us with and to call that his. But in the New Testament, 
we, we do not see a dismissal of that tithe foundation, but we see that that tithe foundation flourishes. Uh, let me explain. In the church, we're told of three or four ways that Christians gave in the first century as followers of Jesus. They gave to, to support those who are poor. And you see that recorded in Romans chapter 15, verse 26. Secondly, how did early Christians, how did the early church give? They gave to support the ministry of the church. You see evidence of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11 through 14. And third, they gave to advance the gospel beyond their own walls. And you see evidence of that in Philippians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. This is an amazing uh, frame of how the early church gave and notice that giving was not restricted by a percentage but instead in many cases people gave all they had people gave far above and beyond the 10 percent because of the need so the 10 percent represents the discipline and the recognition that it belongs to god but in the new testament we see that the 10% was not a ceiling, but rather simply a foundation for you and I giving freely the needs that come because of what God is doing in and around the world. So yes, give the tithe. If you feel that is the conviction God has laid in your heart from the Old Testament, give the tithe. But don't see the tithe as a ceiling or as the goal because the tithe is not the end goal. The tithe is the motivation for how we continue to give as the needs around the world become apparent before us through, through poverty and, and through the, the need of the church ministry being strengthened and through the gospel being shed throughout the globe. So let's give in freedom. This is how giving is a sign of true discipleship. But giving is also a practical test of faith. Notice that we are told to honor God from our wealth. The word there can also mean our possessions. And notice that in the New Testament, we come across principles such as Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that reminds us that our whole lives are like an offering, a sacrifice to God. And so may we see that we are not tested simply by 10%, but maybe our faith is tested by 100%. God, have I, have I surrendered everything to you so that you can use all of my life for your glory and for your purpose? How does the test of giving, not just with a, a legal discipline or a ceiling of 10%, but how does giving freely... How does it test our faith and how do we measure? I love 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, which says, we are not to give begrudgingly. And we are not to give out of coercion, but we are to give freely because God loves a cheerful giver. This is what God desires to see in the life of his children. So giving is a sign of true discipleship, but giving can also test our faith to discern where we are in our walk with Christ. Why is this so important? Because of stories like Annie. Can I tell you the story of Annie? Art Rayner tells this story of a young lady by the name of Annie who had just graduated college and her student loans were, were, were mounding up over and over and the amount was getting higher and higher and Annie found herself one day walking in a very familiar place in Chicago down Michigan Avenue where there were very expensive uh, clotheries and, and she's looking in the windows and, and she's fighting that urge to go and to bless herself with what she felt like was good. And then her cell phone rang as the story is told. And she looks down and it's another pop-up reminding her that her phone bill is delinquent. She re realizes the college debt and she sees the delinquency of the very device in her hand and she's reminded that even her car at least it's due in a couple of months, and she's going to owe a lot because her mileage has gone way past the agreement of the lease. And as she continues to walk, she becomes depressed because the clothing advertisements are reminding her of what she can no longer afford because of the mounting debt and the, and the, the repercussions of poor financial decisions. But there she walks, and then she hears a voice interrupting her heartbreaking thoughts. And the voice says, excuse me, ma'am. 
do you have any change you can loan me? And she turns around, and she sees a homeless man whose wrinkles on his face advertises his very difficult life. And she says, yes, tell me your name. My name is Randall. He says, Randall, uh, I'd love to help you. And she opens up her bag and pulls out her wallet. And when she opens up her wallet, what she sees breaks her heart. There, there's no money. Only a receipt from an expensive restaurant two days ago that she really couldn't afford. And then as Annie tells the story, she breaks down in tears because there stands someone of whom she could bless, but she cannot. Because giving never seemed to be and saving and spending. Finances never seemed to be a clear indication to her of discipleship or of faith. And she's standing there broken that she can't help do something significant for the kingdom. She closes her wallet. She's in tears. She apologizes to Randall. I'm sorry. I just don't have anything. And Randall said to her, that's okay. I see your heart anyway. It's okay. She walks away not feeling okay because of the, the poor decisions. And his story reflects Thousands of stories in the church where in giving and saving have become topics that seem not to fit under discipleship, but they're very important. And many of you have known this all your life and do well here, but many do not. This is a vital part of our discipleship. You may say, wow, Pastor Ken, I'm a lot like Annie. It's too late for me to correct. No, it's not. It's not too late to say, I want to handle my money so that God's kingdom is always first. Which takes us to a second principle we find in our text before us. And here it is. The fundamental way to honor God with your money is through first fruits. I might say, if I could redact this a bit, through the spirit of first fruits. Many of you have studied the idea of first fruits in the Old Testament over and over again, as have I. And we understand that the idea of first fruits meant something in the opening of Scripture more so than it did in the New Testament. But consider that when, when Israel was taking uh, the promised land and when they were in that journey, God through Moses called for first fruits, called for the first of the harvest to be dedicated to God. Do you know that in the first five books of the Bible, some 13 times, including many, many verses, the call to first fruits is given? And first fruits is referenced all throughout the scripture. In the New Testament, the phrase first fruits has become somewhat symbolic. Let me explain. Jesus is called the first fruits in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, of those who have fallen asleep. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is called the first fruit of the Spirit. What does this indicate? This indicates that first fruit represents God ordaining his very best with the promise of more to come. When God called Israel to bring their first fruits, it was to say, God, I give you the chief, the very best, with a promise that more is to come. God, I'm giving all of this to you. So the spirit of first fruit teaches us a couple of motivations in our giving. First, first fruits, although not required in New Testament writings, so we see, but first fruits, as far as a motivation, is present all throughout scriptures. And first fruits, the spirit of first fruit, motivates us first to honor God immediately. I, I love this picture of the Old Testament exhortation to bring your first fruits because therein lies the spirit of saying, God, my first thought is to honor you with what I have. That's my first thought. Wouldn't it be great if, if the lenders or the bills were not the first thought, but God? You may say, well, Pastor, if I don't make the bills the first thought, I am in a lot of trouble. Me too. But the obligation to our finances doesn't have to be re re restricted by what a person needs to give by way of bills or to a lender. But first, the Spirit is God. What do I have in excess that I can bless you with? Even before thinking of what I might be required of in these areas, God, my thought is to honor you. 
I want to be due diligent with what I'm expected to give, but God only subordinate to me thinking, God, some way as I meet my restrictions and my responsibilities, God, my goal is to still honor you. And so the spirit of first fruits is to say, God, how, how can I bring you honor? Yeah, I need to make this bill. I need to make this payment. But God, there is still a blessing here. And God, how can I decide that first you get this? Well, then after I pay my restrictions, what if there's none left for me to do what I would like to do? No, we, we, we shift that interest to saying, God, as I care for those things that seem to call for the monies, God, I want to honor you. So the spirit of first fruit calls us to honor God as our first thought. But the spirit of first fruit also calls us to dedication of all that we have, money and possessions. Because first fruit always announced that there is more to come, that, that this is my chief heart, God, and I want to continue to give first fruits, the spirit thereof, encourages perpetual generosity. God, I must pay you this and give this, but God, here is, here is this money that is not necessarily restricted by a bill or by a loan. And God, how can I take this? And in my own heart, even before next pay period, God, how can I take this as first fruits to say, God, I want you to be blessed by how you would tell me to give what is here to give. So that, God, I can dedicate everything to you. Imagine the elation Annie would feel if her decisions had led her to say, God, I don't have much, but you've blessed me with excess from all the other things I was ob ob obligated to, to give. And God, I want to bless this person in front of me freely, without begrudging, without, without coercion. God, I just want to bless in your name. And this is what we're called to do. The spirit of the first fruit is a fundamental way to say, God, maybe I've not been great with my money, but how do I get on track? God, I want to... I wanna, Handle my money with, with you being my first thought. To honor you being my initial impulse. And then to see that all things are dedicated to you. All that I have and all that I will receive. I want them to be consecrated and dedicated to you, God. God, maybe you'll give me the freedom to use some of that and a blessing uh, in my life and in my family's life. But God, my chief concern is to honor you. And then to have a spirit of dedication of everything that you've blessed me with. As unto you. Oh, what a beautiful spirit of giving. You see, the spirit of first fruits has accomplished some things in my life and is still accomplishing some things because at times I can be a slow learner. We all can, but the spirit of first fruits has had personal effects, and I believe many of you could give similar testimony. The spirit of first fruits corrects and protects me from greed, from storing up my own so that I can simply say, I have. The spirit of first fruits protects me from the, the inclinations of greed. The spirit of first fruit also makes me a wise manager of what God has given me. God, how can I manage this? How can I bless my family? How can I bless others and yet meet my financial requirements? And then the spirit of first fruit also invites me to receive God's blessings. Now, this is amazing. It takes us to our third principle. Because we are called to honor God with our wealth and our first fruit. But look at verse 10. The promise then is that the barns will be filled with plenty and vats of wine overflowing. The third principle is this. God encourages your giving and your generosity through the law of sowing and reaping. My mind goes quickly. The 2 Corinthians chapter 9 again, this time verse 6, where we read that if we, if we sow sparingly, we reap sparingly, but if we sow abundantly, we reap abundantly. That truth comes straight from a context on the church giving to a need. And Paul praised them because at that moment there was generosity and they're given. And Paul reminds them of this principle of sowing and reaping as it pertains to how we give. Now, the principle of sowing and reaping, the law, if you will, is all throughout Scripture. And sometimes that law is used in the context of evil and good decisions. Galatians, I believe, could reflect this. But here and in other places, the law of sowing and reaping reflect, reflects our giving and, and our generosity to give. May I say that 
this conversation might be the most misunderstood and the most mispreached conversation of our time. Because the motivation could fall upon our ears if we're not careful that we can give so that something over here can increase. If my impulse is to give because I can't wait to see how God doubles it here, then I've lost the heart of generosity. I've lost the heart that God intended for the tithe. I've lost the heart for what God intended for the first fruit because tithe, first fruits, however you allow the Scripture to define regular giving for you, the, the call to tithe in the Old Testament, the call, to, the call to generous giving in the New Testament is all about the spirit of the giver. And how can I say I can't wait to give to see the return? How can I say that? If the spirit of the giver is truly God, I want to give back what you deserve. And I want to give generously and cheerfully. So, can we remember this? As we give, under this principle of sowing and reaping, this right here in Proverbs 3.10, can we remember that God secures our status and God assures our provisions? That's what the law of sowing and reaping is all about. How does God secure our status? As we give to him, God would never say to you, you are now the loser because you have given up and the kingdom is the winner. No, you are giving. And in that giving, God is blessing you in return. You're receiving blessings for giving. You've probably been in the place many of us have been in where someone wants to bless you with a gift and you think it's, it's, it's not right and you feel unworthy. And you say, no, no, how can I receive that? And then the giver says, don't take a blessing from me by turning down the gift. Has that ever happened to you? Well, the indication is, I don't know what God is going to do, but I want him to be honored with this giving, so I give so that he can be honored. And so God secures our position or our, our, our status by saying, we are, we are never ones that lose. When we're giving, because there were those in that day who said, if I give the first fruits, what will my family eat if I empty out the barn? Or I want to give the new wine, but what will we drink if I empty out the vats? And God is saying, you give your first fruits, I'll take care of you. You won't be a loser. You won't be one who is of loss. You will still be under my blessings because you're giving from a heart that truly desires to honor me. So God secures our position. And that... He's not going to allow us to lose. He wants to bless us. But our desire is not to be blessed. Our desire is to give and to trust God. But he assures us, I want to bless you. And he'll bless us in his way, not ours. People find it hard this day to separate the word blessing from material gain. God is nowhere saying that the two are the same. But he's saying, I'll bless you. At times, maybe they look alike. But he's saying, I'll, I'll bless you. Because you're honoring me. So he, he secures our position with him, but he also assures our provisions. I believe Proverbs 3.10 is proof that when God says you will, you will receive in return, I don't think God is saying the quickest way to get rich is to give. No, that's not of him. It should not be of us. But God is saying, you will see my provisions for you. So he is assuring provisions. Time does not allow for story after story, does it not? Of how you and I have been on lean budgets at times. I mean, really lean. Really lean. And yet we, we are not going to stop giving. And somehow God undergirds. There have been more than once, especially during seminary years, every account my wife and I had said zero, zero, zero. And we're digging, and we know another paycheck is coming, but also tuition is coming, and, and bills are coming, and we're digging. And then, we're, but God, we're not going to give up on you because... My, my status as your child is secure in you. You've secured that, and you've assured that my provisions will be met. And, and there have been some fun walks to the mailbox my wife and I have had because God just chose to raise up someone to bless us. Because God is good that way. He's just so good. So can we kind of forget losing our status? And can we kind of forget losing our provisions? That's not a part of the topic. And let's give as God calls us to give so that he is honored with our lives. We say yes to God. 
by giving back to him. I, I'm looking at this video of young men and women from the uh, Boys and Girls Club in Metro Atlanta. A young man's on the video. He's making a comment. His name is Aaron Freeman. He doesn't know he's part of an ex experiment, but this nine-year-old boy from the urban area of Atlanta is being interviewed by, by individuals at the Boys and Girls Club, and they say, hey, we've got a gift for you. I have no idea what a Minecraft Lego gift set is, but that's what they were going to give him, and Aaron was pretty excited. We have a gift for you, but we also have a gift here for your family. 80% of the children that were interviewed the way Aaron said responded the way Aaron responded. They're clenching to the Lego set or to the, to the item that they really, really liked. But when it came down to choosing something for me or something for my family, 80% of those children said, it's got to be family. But I had to quote Aaron because this just overwhelms me. Aaron said this. In a split second, he pushed back the Minecraft Lego set. And he grabbed the gift for his family and said, family first. And then the interviewer said, Aaron, why did you make the decision so quickly? And I'm watching the video. Aaron shrugs his shoulder in a matter-of-fact way and says, Legos don't matter. What does matter is family, not your toys. So it's either family or Legos. And then Aaron looked straight at the interviewer and said, I choose family. Now, I push back from watching that and begin to reflect on truths of giving. And, and I have to say, if we want to summarize all of this into one beautiful thing, how do we choose God over ourselves and our giving? How do we choose others over ourselves and our giving? Let's continue to tithe. Let's bring, but let's not let that be a ceiling. And let's continue to give generously for the ministry of the church, for those in need, and for the gospel being advanced around the world. That's how we honor God, with our giving. That's how we say yes to God. Let's stand for prayer.